Well, I've been coming up here for several years now to make videos and this has got to be the most stunning day to make such a video as this. It's January the 1st, 2015 and Happy New Year to you all. And I think this has been the fourth or fifth year that I've done this. And uh, I love coming up here. And if I could, I would make all my messages up here, but uh, it's not always possible due to the weather conditions, but it is amazing today. It was minus three degrees Fahrenheit first thing this morning. And I think it's about uh, two degrees Fahrenheit as of standing here right now, so I'm very pleased. And I've shot some background visual, which you can all see now, and the view is just stunning. Like I said, I've been coming up here for four, five years now, I guess, and what a great day. What a great time to come up and film. And what a great blessing from the Lord to all of us to start the new year. Whatever happened to you in 2014, whatever failures you had, move on, start the new year fresh. Our God is a God of second chances, and that's the way it should be. Just imagine if Satan was in control of everything. In fact, if you study Freemasonry, you will soon discover that they actually worship Satan. Just imagine if he was on the throne. Just imagine how grim and how dire things would be. But uh, praise be to God. Jesus Christ is our Saviour and God. And he's a loving God. He wants all men to be saved. He's drawn all men unto him. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And yet, he allows man to go his own way. Somebody once said very wisely that the Lord has given man enough rope to be saved and at the same time he's given man enough rope to hang himself and that may sound slightly macabre but it's true every man every woman has a conscience which an animal does not have but uh, when we count our blessings and we really should do we should give the Lord thanks for all the blessings that we have we have so much to be thankful for why he uh, has drawn all men unto him, why he has atoned for mankind, why he wants to allow people to spend all of eternity in his presence is beyond me. I know for myself that I'm not worth it, and if you are honest with yourself, you're not worth it either. But uh, the word of God tells us how God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him, no works involved, no church membership, and that whosoever would include Jew and Gentile, that whosoever believeth on him, faith alone, would not perish, go to hell, as you should do, but have present tense eternal life, life without end. And there'll be some of us that will never die. Just picture that for a moment. There will be some of us that will never die. The Lord Jesus said, whosoever believeth in me will never die. Those that have died will live again. But I'm thinking of those that are going to be alive when the rapture comes for us. And it could come at any moment. We know that, of course. And that's why we have been told to be holy, because he is holy. But uh, this year will be my 13th year as a Bible-believing Christian. And I thank the Lord that he took the time to save me. Uh, I don't deserve to be saved. In fact, I was thinking just a few days ago what I was like before I was saved. I was a very self-righteous Catholic, and I can remember uh, working at a company at that time, around that time, when a chap would come round to our floor, and the place that I worked at that time had six or seven floors, about 300 members of staff, and he worked on, I think, two or three floors below me, and he would come around once a month with a piece of paper which he had handwritten and then photocopied saying prayer meeting 1 p.m. on the 13th or 14th floor, I can't remember what floor, what floor it was. And it was every month, it was 1 p.m. start. And uh, I remember in a sort of roundabout way, you know, making fun of him for doing that. And I can remember saying to some of my work colleagues, you know, you'll go to his prayer meeting, won't you? And they said, oh, no, we're not interested in that. And I was just, you know, having a bit of fun with them, really. 
But uh, this chap, I think he was Anglican, I think he was a lay reader as well, had the courage to go around to all of his colleagues and say there's a prayer meeting at one o'clock on the such and such floor. And people would go along. I think about a dozen people would go to his prayer meeting. It was ecumenical. And I don't believe he was born again. And I know that some of the people that I worked with in my immediate remit went to his prayer meeting. And uh, they certainly weren't born again. Some of the things that they would say to me uh, was pretty clear they weren't born again. But nevertheless, this individual meant well. And he had the courage to let people know that he was a Christian. And uh, I can still remember him to this day, a very tall chap, uh, a very nondescript chap, a very gentle chap, a very decent chap. And there was me being a self-righteous Catholic, going to church three or four times a year, very much obsessed with my music career. At that time, I was a semi-professional singer. I'd had many fingers and many pies at that time in my life. I had so many projects in the go. I was quite an entrepreneur, shall we say. And uh, he would go around, as I say, once a month, pushing, pushing this prayer meeting, and people would go along. And uh, looking back at it now, you know, I kind of appreciate what he was trying to do. But as I say, I don't believe he was born again. If you're born again, you won't be ecumenical. You can't be. There's no middle ground in the Word of God. You're either for the Lord or you're against him. In fact, if you go back to the book of Joshua, there's an account where the angel of the Lord uh, appears to Joshua. And Joshua doesn't know who it is straight away because he too lived by faith, not sight. But uh, he says to the angel of the Lord, are you for us or are you against us? And of course, the angel of the Lord was for him and Joshua fell on his face and worshiped the angel of the Lord which I believe was a Christophany, a pre-incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you're either for the Lord or you're against him. And like I said last, like I said last time, I'll say it again, all this blasphemous talk of people going to heaven who don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is just insanity. Why would a Muslim, why would a Jew, why would a Hindu, why would a Freemason want to spend all of eternity worshiping Jesus Christ? Just think about it for a minute. When the Lord said, strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many will want to. When he said that few will find the gate, the way, the entrance, he meant it. Few there be that be saved. And people say, well, why is that the case? Well, because everybody wants to go to heaven, first of all, but nobody wants to die. That's the first thing. Secondly, everybody wants to go to heaven their own way. It's only until you're born again, it's only until you've met the Jewish carpenter from Nazareth, do you realize there's only one way. God became a man in Jesus Christ, and it's simply by faith in Christ alone. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And you reach out to him, he reaches out to you, he saves you, and you're saved to the uttermost. All of your past, present, and future sins are forgiven. And you receive Christ's imputed righteousness, which you get just once. He doesn't keep dispensing his imputed righteousness to a same party every time they fail. And please take the time to understand the difference between a one-off act of repentance to a continual act of confession. In fact, I think there are 31 days in January and I would set this task to anyone who doesn't quite understand the difference between repentance and confession to read 1 John. I would invite those of you which are slightly confused on this subject to spend an entire month reading 1 John every day for 31 days. And you will see the very clear difference between repentance, which is a one-off act, it's a change of mind, it's a change of direction, to a ongoing picture of confession, confessing your sins when you fail, when you stumble, when you commit iniquity, and you will do. But like I say, this is my 13th year of being born again, and I've been on some uh, crazy ride since I've been saved. I've been very blessed to not only travel around the UK for the last 13 years, on and off, preaching to people, uh, speaking to people about the Lord Jesus, but I've been able to go to Spain, Cyprus and Romania. And if it's the Lord's will for me to travel again, I will. 
I'm happy to go anywhere in the world at a moment's notice if he would so wish me to do so. And uh, we did an end of year video where we think we gave out about 44 to 45 to maybe 46,000 tracks throughout 2014. That doesn't include the 8,000 plus tracks that we gave out in Wales back in the summer of last year. And we share these uh, facts with you all, not to boast, not to brag, not to uh, show off, but just to encourage you all and to seek your prayers for us. If two men can give out 40 plus thousand tracks over a period of 12 months, what could one person do who went out, say, once a week? And I read in the Bible that there will be tears in heaven, and I think that could not just be in reference to those which are disciplined severely at the judgment seat of Christ. And I believe that Luke 12 suggests that it's possible that uh, certain wayward people, certain carnal Christians will be publicly chastised by the Lord for living after the flesh before they go into the millennial kingdom. But I think these tears are more likely to be in reference to people who didn't achieve their full potential. Sins of omission are going to be a huge problem. Never mind sins of commission. Your salvation was dealt with on the cross, but sins of, the, sins of omission are going to be dealt with too. And I think many people are going to arrive at the judgment seat pretty shot. Because the way I see it is there will be many people who will arrive thinking, well, you know, I was no one special. I was a housewife or I was a stay-at-home father or I was a farmer or I was a uh, post office clerk or I worked in a carpet shop. I was nothing special. And there will be people among their peer group who will say, you know what, I was from the same background as you were, but I put myself out. I went out to the streets. Oh, I prayed for unsaved family and friends, I spoke to neighbours, I spoke to people at the bus stop, I spoke to people on the train. You know, how you do it is up to you, but people are going to stand in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at the judgment seat. And they will be just mortified, mortified that they could have done a whole lot more. Never mind looking to, you know, your pastor or your deacon or your elder, or whatever system you are part of. Never mind looking to those men to do it all for you. There's things that you could be doing yourself. And I think people are going to arrive at the judgment seat thinking, what was I thinking? What a poor excuse. I couldn't get out. I couldn't do this. I've seen pictures of people in, a in wheelchairs on the streets. I can remember going to Romania back in 2002. And there were disabled people that were going to a prayer meeting. And it really humbled me. I'd been saved maybe six months at that time. And these people came in uh, on wheelchairs. Blind people came along. And some of these people went down on their knees on a concrete floor. And I can still remember it. Uh, we met somewhere outside of Bucharest. I can't remember the, the, the exact location. I have some photographs of my time in Romania. If I find them, I'll put them on the screen. Now you can see the pictures for yourself. And there was a tree which had gone through the ground, straight through the ceiling. I don't quite know what the purpose of it was, but. It was a very poor part of town, and these old people came along, crippled, blind, uh, deaf, just to be with the Lord's people. And uh, that was a pretty uh, humbling day for me. And I've seen other people around the world, you know, that go onto the streets in wheelchairs, uh, just to get the gospel out. Like I say, it's not necessarily uh, your calling to do the same type of evangelism, but I believe it's our duty as Bible, Bible believers to be faithful, to uh, get the word of God out as well as we can. So just a few opening comments. Uh, the sun is very bright at this moment in time. I look almost jaundice. Uh, in fact, I could probably get a tan up here if I wanted to. Imagine that a tan on January the 1st. <laughs> but uh, what I want to really do today, I guess, uh, on this New Year's Day, is not just encourage you all to start the new year on the right footing, to start the right, start the new year, you know, in the right gear. If you start anything, you know, on the wrong footing, on the wrong, in, you know, in the wrong gear, it take a long time for you to get back on track for the Lord. But uh, I really want to first want to encourage you all to look on, push on, press on, to leave all of your failures, all of your uh, problems in the last year. I know some of you have suffered terribly. 
and I go on Facebook every so often, I read my mail and I see people posting comments about relatives that are sick. Somebody posted a comment a few days ago about losing uh, a husband, I think it was. And someone left a comment saying that they'd lost a dog you know, throughout the night, some animal had died, it was very upsetting. And I can understand that, you know, we, you know, we can mourn for certain things, but when I made my video on the subject of backsliding, I wanted to come at it from the position of grieving because what I was finding in my study through backsliding was that God's people were grieving. They were behaving like unsaved people with no hope. And that's why it grieved the Lord in John 11 when he found Mary and Martha almost grieving for the loss of Lazarus. Lazarus was a faithful son of Israel. He was saved. And it's like the Lord was saying to them, listen, you know, he's, he's with the Lord, he's gonna be okay, he's gonna be resurrected. Why are you grieving like unsaved people would grieve? He cut him deep. And I gave you the reading from the Texas Receptus where the apostles were crying and grieving over the Lord's death. So the Lord's people do you know, fall into moments of despair. And I've seen some of these people on Facebook, you know, just opening their hearts to the brethren for prayer, and I appreciate that. So I hope this video will be a blessing to you if you're watching this. And I'm really going to spend the next few minutes now looking at uh, how to reach out to unsaved people because I do believe that when we arrive at the judgment seat, the Lord is going to say to all of us, who have you brought with you? Never mind hiding behind hyper-dispensationalism or hyper-Calvinism. That won't wash. And listen, when you die, when you stand before Jesus Christ, you're standing your own. There'll be no church standing with you. There'll be no deacons or elders standing with you. You'll be standing on your own. And the same is true of an unsaved person. When you stand in the presence of Jesus Christ, you'll stand on your own. You'll have no alibi. You can't say, well, you know, I was told by Richard Dawkins or Charles Darwin or Karl Marx or Sigmund Freud that you know, there was no God. I was told it was all in your mind. That won't wash. You'll stand on your own in the presence of Almighty God. And every word, thought and deed that you ever did will be judged to the minute detail. It's going to be absolutely horrific. My video on God laughing at the wicked in hell is a very vivid description of the moments after you've been judged the great white throne judgment when you've confessed Jesus Christ as Lord meaning he's God that the triune God will laugh in your face you rejected my son you spat on him you treated him with contempt you made fun of his children off into the lake of fire you go and that roaring laugh from the throne of heaven is just going to be like thunder it's going to ricochet throughout your entire system and at the second death, you become blind, you become mute, and off you go into the lake of fire, or you burn forever. Horrific. And yet you sent yourself there. Nobody made you go to hell. You had a conscience, you ignored it. You had churches in every corner, and yes, they may have been apostate, but they all pointed upwards to heaven, not downwards to hell. And you could have responded to that light had you wanted to, but you chose not to. But let's say you're watching this video and you're thinking to yourself, you know what, I need to get saved. I come to the end of my rope. I can't go on any longer. I'm sick of sin. I'm sick of myself. And everything I've tried has failed. Uh, and I see these Christians with peace. I see these believers with uh, some backbone, some ability to put themselves out. And I hear about faithful brethren denying themselves, picking up their crosses every day and following the Lord. And that goes back to my earlier comments on confessing your sins, you know, presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice daily to the Lord, which is your reasonable service. And you might think to yourself, you know what, I need to get right with the Lord. And this is your opportunity. And you can, get, you can get saved before I even finish the next second. You could be saved right now. You could have been saved two, three, four, five, six seconds ago. Salvation is a free gift. And I'll tell you very quickly, we do outreach every Sunday and uh, we have some Islamic gentlemen that are in our town doing their outreach and they're pretty harmless for the most part, they're ecumenical and uh, they like to uh, have a bit of banter with us and they walk past us every hour and a half on their way to pray. And I was uh, responding to one of the mullahs last Sunday or Sunday last and he said to me, you need to pray, you need to pray, in reference to me. And I said to him, pray where you stand. You can pray where you stand, you can get saved where you stand. 
You don't need to go to, off to a little room with your prayer mats to be saved or pray. You can pray where you stand. I walk every day. I walk five miles a day and I pray as I walk. And it's great fellowship. Even now, as, I, as I'm making this message, I've got a Bible in my hand. I'm still thinking about subjects. I'm giving the Lord thanks and glory for all that he's given me. But you can get saved where you stand. You don't need to go to a prayer room to get saved. And he's had his reward. Matthew 6 said these people have had their reward. Look at me, everybody. I'm off to go to a prayer meeting. Look at me, everybody. I'm fasting. It's foolishness. It's self-righteousness. But they're not saved. You wouldn't expect anything else from them, would you, really? But let's start, if we may, in Luke 19. And I'll say this also very quickly before I move on. i get back to this in a minute. You know, I'll say this very quickly. That we do witness these Muslims. Chat came over to me just before Christmas. Very unhappy man. And he said to me, uh, why aren't you standing at the top of the town? Right next to where the Muslims are standing. Why are you down here outside some shop? And I said to him, well, we do normally go at the top. But it's first come, first served. That's how it works on the street. You don't stand next to someone else. We have Jehovah's Witnesses on our streets. We don't stand right next to them. They don't stand next to us. And we've stood next to Muslims, and we'll do it again if we need to. But they have their own spot. We have our own spot. And uh, they don't bother us. We don't bother them. But I've witnessed these Muslims. And he was going on about how upset he was. They were in the, they were in the, they were in the town during Armistice Day without any poppies on. And he was sort of, you know, just bemoaning the state of the UK. And I thought to myself, yes, but it's people like you that have caused the... UK to go the, the way that it's gone. People turn from Christ, Christ turns from them. What do you expect? There's going to be a power vacuum. People are going to flock to false religions or no religions. They're going to uh, worship anyone and anything but the one true God. So don't give me a hard time. And I know why he was doing it. He was convicted. You know, he knew he needed to be saved. And I gave him a tract. And I was able to, you know, explain the gospel to him. But, you know, as I say, if you take a stand for the Lord, you'll be blessed enormously for it. And you look back on some of these events and you think, I'm so glad I did it. I'm so glad I put myself out. But it's people that don't do anything that will fall into this self-pity, you know, misery loves company. And I don't particularly care for those types of people, people who uh, sit on their hands complaining about, you know, the way the world is. If you had something in your life, if you were truly born again, if you had a uh, knowledge of the Lord, if you truly walked with him, you wouldn't care about what goes on around you. And yes, people do get down. There are situations where it seems very grim. And there are times when you think, you know, what's it all for, Lord? But uh, you were told to keep pushing on. <coughs> you were told to be faithful unto death. Uh, so, you know, as I say, people have all sorts of odd views on different subjects. And uh, as long as you're faithful, as long as you keep pushing on, as long as you walk by faith and trust the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be fine. But when you start to turn from him, when you start to embrace secularism or foreign religions, if you turn from the truth and the simplicity of Christ, don't be uh, overly uh, upset you know, if you fall into the trap of apathy. Um, but anyway, let's get back to my text, which I mentioned a few moments ago. Luke 19, and this could be for you. Let's start in verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was a chief among the publicans, and he was rich. A publican would be a tax collector. He's a very wealthy man. And he may have been saved before Luke 19, we can't be sure. But this man would have been very respected among his peers. He was a very wealthy man. And at the same time, he would have been despised among his neighbours and his community, which very much pictures how it should be for us. Let me say this to you, if you're born again and people love you, if you fit in with people, if you're the life of the party, as they say, something's wrong. Jesus said, they hated me, they'll hate you. Look at verse 3. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. He wanted to see the Lord. He had a great desire to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. And this goes back to my comments I made in my last video, Patrick, how John 1 speaks about people being drawn unto the Lord and men being introduced to the Lord via third parties, which is a fascinating subject. But this man is going to make it his uh, number one priority to meet the Lord Jesus Christ. This picture is true repentance, not just a heart knowledge, not just a, well, yes, you know, I think I believe in the Lord. This is something that he's going to do. He's going to make it his business to meet the Lord. Look at verse 4. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, if he was to pass that way. Just go back to verse 1 and verse 2. He's a rich man, 
He's the chief among the tax collectors, and this tax collector has now climbed up into a tree. Just imagine that for a moment. This man's got it all. He's probably the wealthiest man in Jericho. And he said, I want to see the Lord. I'm a small man. I'm going to climb up into the sycamore tree to see the, the traveling Messiah. Acts 9, the Lord Jesus Christ knocked Paul off his horse. That shows that sometimes the Lord will take a direct approach to reach out to people. This man went up a tree to see the Lord. Paul went down on his knees to see the Lord. Look at verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste, and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. That's the first account in scripture, to the best of my knowledge, where the Lord Jesus Christ invited himself into someone's house. And just take a few moments just to, you know, mull over this for a second. This man has climbed up into a tree. That's pretty uh, humbling and also humiliating. He's probably covered in you know, tree bark or what have you. And he's seen the Lord Jesus Christ among everyone else. And the Lord says, I know you, you're Zacchaeus. Come down for today, I will abide at thy house. And that goes back to Romans 16, where Paul lists all these names of people. And it's like a roll call of all the good and the great, those which were born again. But the Lord knew, 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 uh, he knew Zacchaeus, which goes back to John 1 again. You know, Andrew comes along, he says, Lord, you know, or he says to his brother, Simon, we've met the Messiah who Moses has written about. And Simon goes to meet the Lord. And the Lord says, I know you, you're Simon. You're going to be called Cephas. And he meets Nathaniel, says, behold, a man with no guile. This is very similar language. Zacchaeus has known of the Lord. He's gone up into a tree. Jesus has seen Zacchaeus. He says, come down for today. I must abide at thy house. Also, this goes back to justification in the sight of God. Romans chapter 4. Versus justification in the sight of man, James chapter 2. This man had faith in the Lord, which God saw first of all. That would have justified him by his faith in the Lord alone. And on top of that, his faith produces works, which is then seen in the sight of others. Look at verse 6. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. That's how it should be for you. You should be joyful. You should be happy that salvation has come to you. If you're the sort of person who's always misery, always, always, you know, always very miserable, always very depressed, always very, you know, down in your luck, you know, always moaning and complaining, you need to confess that, turn from that. You should be full of joy and happiness. Look at verse seven. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, "But he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. He was a sinner, but he was no more a sinner than the Pharisees, than the Sadducees, than all the other so-called religious elites." And that term murmured simply means to be angry, it simply means to be critical, it simply means to find fault. You know, if you find fault in everyone and in everything, take a look at yourself in the mirror, because you're probably the biggest failure in your life. But he was a sinner, he turned from unbelief to belief, he turned from a position of uh, worshipping himself to being a true worshipper of the one true God. Look at verse 8, and Zacchaeus stood, I said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. That's a clear picture of repentance. This man had obviously deceived people over time. He was a tax collector. Uh, he was a greedy man. He was you know, in the bond of covetousness. And he said, If I have done anything wrong, Lord, I will restore him fourfold. Look at verse 9. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. For as much as he also is a son of Abraham, the just shall live by faith. This day salvation has come to this house. This man got saved in a second. And once he was saved, his faith demonstrated that he was saved. We know from Ephesians 2 that you are saved unto good works. Your good works don't save you, and your good works don't keep you saved, but your good works are evident that you are saved. And no two people are gonna have the same level of works, this man's works were effective, first of all, in him restoring fourfold to those that had, to those that he had wronged. Look at verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. If you're not born again, you're lost. And if you're lost, you need to be reconciled to the Lord. And you can be reconciled to him if you turn to him. There's no works involved. You just come as you are, as a broken sinner, a reprobate. Someone who knows they're sinful, someone who knows they are filthy. And he said, Lord, please be merciful to me, a sinner. There's no sinner's prayer involved. There's no, uh, you know, 
needing to term every possible sin imaginable. That will come in time, but you come as you are, and he will receive you unto himself. So you get these verses, you take them all down, you find that faith is what saves Zacchaeus. Faith produced works, and from the works, the Lord Jesus commends this man, and he says, today, salvation, eternal salvation, that's all you get from the New Testament, has come to this house. And Zacchaeus was happy, he was joyful, and off he went, a regenerated man. And I think these verses need to be read and reread by our Lordship Salvation uh, friends, if you will, because they make it very difficult to reach the Lord. They create this uh, impossible route uh, to heaven, which is no route. And when you muddy the waters, if you put works in the way, you end up preaching another gospel, which according to Galatians 1 is a cursed gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Did you truly believe on him? Let's say you watch this video and you're doubting your salvation. Let's say you watch this video and you're not sure if you're saved or not. Did you truly believe on him? Paul told you to make your calling and election sure. He told you to reach out and grab eternal life. It's already yours. You've already been given an imputed righteousness, but you were told to make your calling and election, election sure. You were told to grab hold of eternal life. Did you believe in vain? Did you come via the Romans road? Did you come through a sinner's prayer? Did you come through a one, two, three, pray with me sort of concept? Did you get baptized and think that was gonna save you? That won't work. Did you believe in sincerity? The just shall live by faith. Verse three, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the 12. After that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Did you believe on that? Did you believe on his crucifixion, burial, and resurrection? If you did, you're fine. If your faith was solely based on that alone, you're fine. But if you thought there were some works involved, if you thought perhaps there was some church membership, or you thought, well, perhaps there was some tithing involved, or speaking in tongues was evidence of being saved, no. Did you believe on his burial, resurrection, to save you? If you did, you're saved. And that's the gospel in a nutshell, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's faith and faith in that alone to save you. We are imperfect people. Even after we are saved, we are still imperfect people. And I wrote in December's newsletter about the subject of papal infallibility, an absurd doctrine. And I shared some accounts of some of the the greatest men that stumbled, and I gave the account from Galatians chapter 2 where Peter was teaching another gospel. Can you believe it? Albeit temporarily, but it was still another gospel nevertheless, and Paul had to publicly rebuke him for it. He failed, he stumbled. And you can be sure that that wasn't a one-off event. That may have happened on many occasions. We know from Acts chapter 10 how Peter was almost arguing with the Lord about not... Um, eating something which was no, was, was no longer considered unclean by the Lord. And he was told to go to Cornelius, witness to him, and give him the truth. And he's almost arguing with the Lord, but he gets it eventually. And we know about Paul. Paul was, you know, probably the best in the New Testament, but we know from Romans 11 and Philippians 3 how he too had an ongoing battle with his old nature. So the best stumble. But, uh, you know, if you take the time to examine yourself in truth and in sincerity, you'll be fine. And I'll tell you this also, outside of the triune God, outside of the Godhead, you are the most important person in the entire universe in the eyes of the Lord, if you are born again. Just read the account from Luke 15 of the prodigal son who drifted away from the Lord, and the Lord moved heaven and earth to find his way with a child and bring him back. And it says, as the prodigal son was coming to the father, the father saw him and he ran to be reconciled to his son. What a great picture. And you can approach that as a picture of a 
repentant sinner coming to the Lord for the first time, or you can picture it as a wayward, backslidden Christian coming back to the Lord. It doesn't matter. Either way, the Father is ready and willing to run and be reconciled to that person. But Paul tells me here how he delivered unto them, first of all, the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins, all of your past, present, and future sins, according to the scriptures, Old Testament, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. If you could find the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, it would all be over in a split second. And I witnessed to my Islamic friends, so-called, and I told them how it's great to be born again, and like I said a few moments earlier, you can pray where you stand, you can get saved where you stand. You can be saved right now just by praying to the Lord, just by calling on the Lord, reaching out to the Lord. The Word of God tells us how man looks on the outward appearance, James chapter 2, but God looks on the inward appearance, Romans chapter 4. Justification in the sight of God, Romans chapter 4, justification in the sight of man, James chapter 2. And it says here that after that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. Of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. You could have gone to Israel around 56 AD if you were an inquiring party and you could have said, hey, I've just read 1 Corinthians 15 and it says over 500 people saw the risen Christ simultaneously and I want to find out who you are. Those people are alive. You could have done that. You could have gone to Israel. You could have said, I heard that he appeared. He did great miracles. And you could have met the living Saviour. That's how they were able to spread Christianity like wildfire. Not only did they have the Jewish apostolic sign gifts, not only were they able to do great miracles, which no one else could do, but people were alive. People saw the risen Christ. I mean, the apostles were eyewitnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they came to him they received him, and he, he changed, and he saved them to the uttermost. What a great blessing. So there you are. I think I've said all I want to say on this very cold January 1st day. It's still very pretty behind me. I can see the fog uh, coming and going. And uh, as I said, I'd be quite happy to make videos up here until the cows come home. Uh, but uh, sometimes it's not always possible due to the weather and uh, also being rather busy up here as you would appreciate the open air pulpit as I've dubbed it as I've adopted it to be is a rather popular place uh, to come uh, but that's okay so make 2015 a good year for you make it a good year for yourself um, don't spend all your time looking back over your failures over the last 12 months there's no reverse gear for us there's no point uh, trying to reverse up. There's no point trying to depart from the Lord. If you're having a tough time, just hang in there. It does pass. The Lord is going to prune, he's going to purge those that belong to him. And I went through a pretty tough purging a few days ago. I wasn't expecting it. And uh, the word of God makes it clear from John 15 how the Lord purges us to bring forth more fruit. In fact, I'll say this also if I may before I sign out. The Lord showed me something a few months ago which I wasn't expecting him to show me and he gave me a glimpse of what my life would have been had I not been born again. And every so often you, know, you think to yourself, what would I have done? How, how, how would my life have gone if I wasn't born again? Because I was a very ambitious guy before I was saved. I wanted to be a you know, professional singer. You know, I made it to semi-professional. I made three albums and I had a big band. It all seems you know, very, you know, in, in, in vain now and folly. Um, completely irrelevant, worthless. But at the time it was a big deal to me. And he showed me the Lord, what my life would have been like had I not been saved. And I can tell you it was horrific. Some of the things he showed me, I can't even, you know, take the time to you know, explain on camera. I guess you would have had to have known me before I was saved and, now, and, and know me now to perhaps get some idea of how it would have gone. But it wasn't pretty at all. You know, I thought several times when I first got saved, you know, could it, could it happen? You know, could I have been a semi-pro going into a professional career? 
could I have continued to be a lapsed Catholic? What would have happened? And uh, the truth is no, obviously not. When you come to him, you come broken, you throw yourself at his mercy, and he makes you alive, and he gives you a new heart, and you set a belief, so on and so forth. But uh, what I was showed, what, you know, what he showed me a few weeks ago, was an eye-opener, it really was. And I think we need to do that as Christians, we need to examine ourselves regularly in light of scripture. Not just to make sure that we are in the faith, uh, but to really give him all the glory and the thanks. I think so many times we take a lot for granted. And I have no interest, you know, don't get me wrong, I have no interest going back to my old way of life at all. You know, I've had people contact me on my music days, this was years ago now, you know, saying uh, how they missed those days and how it would have been great had we, you know, as an orchestra, have made it. And I said, no, I'm not interested. And I wasn't interested. I sold all my music when I got saved. I gave everything away. You know, I was able to send some of the money that I had raised from what I had sold to uh, a fellowship in the Philippines at that time. But uh, I think it's good for all of us to do that, to really examine ourselves and maybe to say to the Lord, please show me, just give me a glimpse perhaps what my life would have been like had I not been saved. And any doubt that perhaps you made a wrong decision will be dealt with quick smart. But what I was shown was pretty, uh, pretty alarming. And, uh, you know, this is my 13th year now of being born again. And uh, I wouldn't have missed it for the world. You know, and I watch people, I see people, you know, who have made it in that career, a career which I wanted to be a part of, a career which I spent a lot of money and time, my own money, and my time desperately trying to get into. And now I couldn't care less. I really couldn't care less now. You now, if you said to me, James, there's an opportunity for you to perform at the Palladium or Carnegie Hall or Las Vegas, not interested. You couldn't pay me to go and perform in those places. But before I was saved, I would have been down there quick smart. I mean, I spent a small fortune you know, making CDs before I was saved and hiring uh, rehearsal halls to practice the band, to rehearse the band. And, you know, making CDs and just trying to chase a dream which was never going to happen. And yet the Lord in his goodness allowed me to run with it for several years. He allowed me to experience uh, the way that world works for a period of time. And as a result of that, I think I've got experience when it comes to speaking to people on the streets. Now I thank the Lord for those of you which have always been saved, or those of you which came from Christian families and got saved when you were very young. And I was in my 20s when I got saved. You know, I had experienced life before I was saved, and I had a lot of sin in my life before I was saved too. Uh, so I've got some experience of what it was like before I was saved. I'm not one of those goody two-shoes, you know, a lot of people. Uh, I've never experienced life. They've come from good Christian families. You know, they've prayed every night on their knees with their families. That wasn't my family. You know, I never read the Bible before I was saved. I think once or twice I read bits of Genesis as punishment before I was saved. Uh, never make your children read the Bible as punishment, by the way. It can turn them against the Word of God. But uh, I think apart from being forced to read bits of Genesis before I was saved, I knew very little about the Bible. I had a knowledge of God. I knew very little about Jesus Christ. Uh, I'd never taken the time to study him. I'd never taken the time to read the scriptures. I was quite content going to church three or four times a year. And the priests that I knew were pretty, you know, uh, laid back. I never had any problems with any of them. You know, uh, many of the priests that we knew were friends of our family. They'd come around the house and have coffee with my parents. So when I got saved, it was a complete transformation. You know, Patrick got saved first, and I got saved afterwards. And, uh, you know, we left the Catholic Church completely by doctrine. Just doctrine alone, nothing else. Uh, you know, and we reached out to our friends and family, and we still pray for them. I can remember writing to all of my work colleagues when I got saved, trying to share the gospel with them. I remember visiting friends of mine and witnessing to them about the Lord. I can remember witnessing to my family and everyone that I knew at the time. You know, 13 years on, none of them are saved. None of them are saved whatsoever, just Patrick and I. 
So if you want to pray for my family, please pray for them. I, you know, I appreciate that. You know, Patrick appreciates that too. And pray for our ministry. As of this Saturday, we are going out 30 minutes on the radio on a Saturday and a Sunday. And uh, ETC Radio, Lord willing, will reach the world. I got an email from Radio Miami, which airs our broadcasts. How the signal is being heard in Cyprus, uh, Norway and Israel. It's a great blessing. So please pray for ETC Radio. And our goal, I guess, for, say, January the 3rd or 4th or 5th of 2016, will be to have a seven day a week radio presence. It takes time, it takes money to put radio messages together, but the Lord has been very kind to us and some faithful brethren have stepped forward. And you know who you are to stand with us and we thank you very much for doing so. But our goal in these last days is to go out seven days a week, if we can, 30 minutes a day, seven days a week. So maybe pray for that, see what the Lord would have you do if you want to stand with us on that. But as far as we are, uh, as far as we are concerned, as far as present goes anyway, uh, as far as I should say, as far as I'm concerned, I'll get in eventually, as far as I'm concerned, you know, ETC Radio is going out just for Saturday and Sundays for the time being, 30 minutes a day. So, I guess a quick semi uh, rant, a bit of a quick update on uh, what's happening, uh, some scriptures to share with those that are not saved and to encourage those that are saved, uh, a bit of a brief testimony. And I think it's good to give a testimony every so often. I don't think you need to go into great detail. I've seen some testimonies and they go on and on and on and it's all me, me, me. I don't care for that. You know, people embellish their testimonies too. Just be honest. I mean, Paul gave us testimony. He didn't go on and on and on. He didn't embellish it. He was more keen to talk about Jesus. And I think that's how it should be. You know, if you've got a testimony, give it when you need to, as and when. But don't keep going on and on about yourself, where you came from and where you are now. And don't boast either. Boast in Christ. Don't boast in yourself. Uh, but uh, I'll say this also one final time, you know, and it needs to be said because I, people continue to contact me about, you know, Lordship, Salvation, Repentance and, you know, defining holiness. Spend 31 days of January reading First John. Read it, apply it, and... Uh, take it as it is and you'll see that first of all you will sin after you're saved and if you say that you haven't sinned after you are saved you're a liar and John says you make God a liar but if you do confess your sin to God he will forgive you and cleanse you to keep you in fellowship with the Lord you don't keep repenting you don't keep getting born again again and again and again that's, that's not how this thing works you get a one-off imputed righteousness given to you the moment you believe on him. I called on the Lord 13 years ago. I went down on my knees and I confessed to him, I prayed to him. I didn't know what the plan of salvation was correctly at that time. How could anyone know what the correct plan of salvation was? But what I did know was that I was a sinner in need of being saved. I was like Zacchaeus. And I got up in that tree, or like Paul, I went down on my knees and I called on his name and he saved me. And he gave me a new heart, he gave me a completely new direction of life and within several months the band was cancelled, I came away from the band, the Catholic Church was forsaken forever and uh, within the first few months I was on the streets giving out tracts. If you said to me 13 years ago, James, you'll be standing at a place like this giving Bible studies, giving a testimony, if you, you, you were to tell me I would, you know, I would be giving out thousands of tracts you know, in a year, one year period, I wouldn't have believed it. But that's a miracle, isn't it? Miracles still happen. And the greatest miracle is a miracle of regeneration. And I give God thanks and praise for all the blessings that he's given me. And uh, when I do start to feel sorry for myself, and I do, we all do, I just confess my sins to him. I turn back to him. And I go for a nice, nice long walk and I listen to uplifting messages. I pray for the brethren around the world and on the streets that I meet. I uh, look back on past victories, victories over sin. I look back at some of the high points of my Christian life. But above all, I look 
to the Lord. I keep my eyes focused on Him completely and I keep reading the Word of God and I promise you it will transform your life. And I'll tell you something else. What I'm now doing, and this has been a great blessing to me, is I am reading the Gospels in one sitting every night. And it takes me about three and a half hours to read Matthew, three hours or so to read Mark, three and a half to read Luke, and about three hours or so to read John. One sitting every night before I go to sleep. And I'm seeing things that I haven't seen before. And I spoke last time about coming across the Lord's aunt, Salome, Mary's sister. And Salome, the Lord's aunt, approaches him in Matthew 20. She says, Lord, please make my sons to sit on your left hand and on your right hand. And the reason why I think she's his aunt is because his mother, Salome's sister Mary, also approached the Lord in John 2 to prepare wine for the marriage supper or the marriage feast in Cana. And as far as I can think off the top of my head, that's the only two occasions where two women approach the Lord directly and ask him for such a thing. Yes, you've got the South Phoenician woman who comes to him to seek healing of her daughter. You've got Jairus who approaches him to have his son healed, uh, his daughter healed, I should say, the young girl from Talitha Kumi. The young girl from Mark 5, and he says Talitha Kumi, which is our mate, you know, rise up little girl. But it's smoothing those people. I think Salome and Mary are the two women that approached him to do something for them because they knew him. And I hadn't seen it before, I hadn't seen Salome so clearly, I hadn't even considered that, you know, the sons of Zebedee would be his cousins. And that would explain, wouldn't it, why he entrusted John to look after Mary. Mary had other children, but they were young. And uh, it's quite possible they were born after Luke chapter 3, I think it is, when the Lord is 12 and he, he gets lost in the temple. There's no mention of his other brethren at that point in time, but you find him in Mark 6. So you've got Mary and Joseph with other children, and he says to John, who's about the same age as Jesus, Behold thy mother, and he says to Mary, Behold thy son. And I'm finding little things like that, you know, and I'm finding other bits and pieces which I'm interested in. I gave you the other account of Peter and John following the Lord to you know, the palace, uh, Caiaphas' palace, the high priest's palace. And John goes in, and John gets Peter in. There's no papal infallibility there. Peter waits outside. John has the uh, the ability to get Peter in to the courtyard of the high priest's palace. And that showed me also that John was much more, you know, well-to-do, shall we say, much more connected, shall we say, than I first thought. So I'm, I'm finding that's a great blessing to me, and you can never read the Bible enough, and I don't know, I don't know why people criticise the Bible. I don't know why Christians criticise the Bible, and I hear Christians criticise the Scriptures, People say the Bible is not the word of God. Yes, it is. Can you worship the Bible? Yes, if you're not careful. But so too can the Greek and Hebrew scholars. They too worship this infamous original text, which of course does not exist. Anybody can worship anything. And yet it's possible that you can spend your time talking about this book and worshipping this book. Yes, that is possible. But for the most part, people don't do that. If you're born again, your bone is bone, your flesh of his flesh. You love him. But he says, unless you abide in me, you cannot do anything. And you need the scripture to grow. So I don't know why people make you know, a bit of a commotion against those of us which are Bible believers. I'm quite proud to be called a Bible believer. Don't call me a Protestant. I'm not a Protestant. I'm a Bible believer. Premillennial, pre-tribulational, once saved, always saved. Or if saved, always saved. Uh, no Jewish apostolic sign gifts either. That's my position. Uh, and I'll tell you something, I'll say it again, if you read that book every day faithfully, if you pray every day faithfully, if you are a doer of the word, not just a hearer of the word, your life will be transformed. Absolutely, totally transformed. But it's going to take some work, it's going to take some time. And that's, this is the problem, is that people are so preoccupied with the world. And I include myself, I get very easily distracted. You know, my phone goes, I get uh, emails coming in. Um, I might want to see a documentary on the television. People say, well, you should have a television. Well, fine. But you people, be honest now, you people, and it sounds so pious, I haven't got a television, but you people have got the internet. I mean, you've watched this video, you've got the internet, haven't you? And you people, you go online, you watch the same programs online that you used to watch on the television. 
True? Yes, it's true. So don't be too pious, don't be too quick to condemn us, those of us which have a television, which occasionally watch it. Um, but if you switch that thing off, if you switch your phone off, if you switch your iPad off and whatever else you've got, and spend time in the Word of God, your life will be completely transformed. And I'm enjoying it very much, reading the four Gospels. And I will do something on Mark, maybe this month, I'm not sure. Uh, as always, we've got many projects on the go. And uh, as always, enjoying what we do, enjoying my salvation, just uh, worshipping the Lord in truth and in spirit. But uh, start with First John, get your mind clear, and then uh, perhaps do what I'm doing, maybe, I don't know. Maybe take some time to read the, the, the Word of God in, a, in one sitting. I find it doesn't work for me if I read it in parts. If I spend an hour reading Matthew, the first 18 chapters, shall we say, and if I go back to it the following day, I lose my, my train of thought. I can't pick up where I was. I lose some of the peace, some of the joy, some of the power, some of the victory. So it works for me. It may not work for everyone, but it works for me. And at the same time, don't neglect the Old Testament. Try and balance the two. There's no uh, right or wrong way of doing this. You know, no two people will approach the scripture the same way. But for what it's worth, for my own opinion, what's working for me anyway, I'm happy to share it with you all that it's working for me. Daily readings of the scriptures. And also clears your mind, it clears all the clutter out of your system. It gives you the ability to think and, and uh, operate correctly through the spirit, not the flesh. So when you go onto the streets and you talk to people, you, know, you can actually cut through all of the uh, all of the nonsense, you know, all the uh, false arguments that people put up, and just get straight down to the nitty gritty. Uh, but above all, it's God's word; it's pure. And uh, you know, people die for that. People die to give us the Bible. You can't ever underestimate what people went through to give us the Bible. And I was told quite recently. I think Patrick told me he was reading about the AV, and he. He told me that when the translators put the King James together, whenever they came to the word Lord or God, they changed the tip on their pens to reflect the holiness of God. Can you imagine the uh, NIV committee doing that? Can you imagine the new King James committee doing that? Can you imagine the Watchtower doing that? Or the NASV? Or any of these modern Bibles? No, you can't. But to the credit of the AV translators, they knew what they were doing was a serious business, they revered the Lord, they believed on the Lord, they were probably saved for the most part, even though they were Anglican, I think they probably were saved for the most part, and they changed the tip of their pens to reflect the name Lord, or God. And that is great. That's a great sense of you know, reverence and humility. It goes back to, to Zacchaeus again, climb up that tree. He didn't care what his neighbours thought of him, he was hated by his neighbours, and he was probably well thought of by his peers. He didn't care. Up that tree he went. And look at Paul, knocked off the, the horse. Paul, this well-to-do man, this scholar, I'm gonna kill those Christians, I hate those Christians. Knocked off the horse, flat on his face, blind for three days, I believe it was. He says, Lord, what will you have me to do? And you know the rest. That man changed the world, he turned it upside down. But, uh, yeah, so take these things, take them to, take them to heart and uh, just uh, be thankful that we have the Word of God that is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword and it cuts right down to the marrow it cuts right down to the heart of the matter and if you use it, if you use it faithfully if you allow it to uh, change your life, it will do and just say to the Lord, Lord use me as a faithful servant to thee uh, Father in heaven you say uh, please allow thy word to penetrate my heart Please allow thy word to uh, be used to win souls to thee. Please allow thy word to draw sinners unto thee. And please allow thy word uh, to give thy servant victory over sin. And you watch it, you watch it. You watch that thing start to happen. You watch your life start to be transformed. You watch yourself start to become more bolder and stronger. And the boys separate themselves from the men. Oh yeah. And you'll find yourself, you are a brother in the Lord, and you've been saved several years now, you'll find yourself going on the streets. And after a while of giving out tracts, it won't be enough for you. You want to start street preaching. 
and you want to start going up to people on the streets that aren't saved, you may want to go up to Muslims or Jehovah's Witnesses. Be gentle, don't go up there all guns blazing, I will say that. Be gentle, but uh, you'll find yourself growing, you'll find yourself being victorious. Some of you sisters out there, you'll find yourself having less time for your uh, secular you know, activities. You won't want to spend time on committees or um, going to carnal uh, events like dog shows or horse shows or sport events. You know, you'll be a, a true woman of God and you'll be a great wife to your husband. And your husband may not be saved, but he'll see the Lord in you and you will become a living epistle. And you could be a saved brother with an unsaved wife. She'll see the Lord in you. You'll be a living epistle. And your kids may not be saved, but they'll see a changed father or a changed mother. Uh, but above all, you do it for God's glory. You do it for his glory. You do it for your own relationship with him to grow in grace. As I say, people bled and died to give us the Bible. But the most important thing is the blood of Christ. That's what saves us. The shed blood of Christ shed for the sins of the world and it's our faith in the precious blood of Christ which saves us and keeps us saved and I really hope and pray that for those of you which don't understand eternal security that you get it down that you understand it it's such a great blessing it's, it's one of the clearest doctrines of the New Testament how the Lord went into the Holy of Holies once how he has obtained eternal redemption for us once how he, was drawn, how he has drawn all men unto him once how he has granted repentance to the Jews and the Gentiles once. How he died for the sins of the world once. And if you come to him as a beggar, as an unsaved man or woman, on your knees, like Paul perhaps, or up a tree like Zacchaeus, it doesn't matter. If you come to him humble, if you come to him broken, if you come to him sincerely, wanting to be saved and set free from yourself and to become a slave, a rebel to righteousness, holiness, he will do so. Make 2050 in the year where you're happy, holy, and healthy. That's the year for you. Never mind 2014 or 2013. Never mind all the failures that have gone before. Never mind people that have wronged you. Never mind all your disappointments. We've all had them. Just keep pushing on. Allow Jesus Christ to continue to do a great work in you. And uh, remember that every day his mercy is in you. His love is new each and every day. And uh, enjoy your salvation. Rest in the finished work of Christ. And uh, just be submissive to the Holy Spirit. Be in obedience to the triune God. Take each day as it comes. And he'll bless you, he will transform you, and he will do more and more miracles for those of you which are born again. If you're not born again, come to him. Cry out to him. And uh, as you saw from Zacchaeus, there'll be no works involved. Don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. Don't think, well, I'll get hold of this sin, or I'll get hold of that sin, or I'll deal with this thing, or I'll deal with that thing first. Come as you are. People are dying every day. 150,000 die every day. 8,000 an hour. Planes are going missing again. Boats are being... Uh, Boats are, you know, are capsizing. I hear the news every day of awful events happening around the world. People are dying and death comes like a thief in the night. People don't think it's going to come. People say, well, you know, I'm still a young guy. Or people say, no, I believe in deathbed conversions. Look at a thief on the cross. Yes, but there were two thieves on the cross. Only one got saved. Don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. Your life is like a vapour. Here for a while, then it vanisheth away. Don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. Get saved now. Come to him. I've watched these documentaries over the last several years of these well-to-do pop stars and rock stars and movie stars. You know, the sort of people that I wanted to be once upon a time, I'm ashamed to say. And they die young, some of these people. They have drug problems. They have alcohol problems. They have sex problems. They have all sorts of issues going on in their lives, which you don't see anything about. You don't hear about it. They give the impression of being so well-to-do. People follow these, these idols, you know, think they're wonderful and they're not. And they couldn't care less about you. You know, and when they die, you read the autopsy reports, and you're just shocked. You're shocked at how these people lived and died. I mean, I, I remember somebody who we, who we knew who uh, 
was involved with the autopsy of uh, Jimi Hendrix. And uh, this friend was a doctor. Um, she was a friend of the family. And she told us when they did the autopsy on Jimi Hendrix, how they found a tail. The man had a tail. Now, I know tails aren't unheard of, but they're quite a rare thing to have. And you know, it kind of shocked her, this pathologist, to see you know, someone like Jimi Hendrix, who was worshipped by many people, to have had a tail. Other well-known people have died, and their liver has been shot to pieces. You know, as I say, the Lord looks on the inward, but man looks on the outward. A man is many times besotted with the outward appearance. But God says, forget the outward appearance. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination. Look on the inward appearance. God looks in the heart of man. And God is interested in the heart of man. The heart of man in and of itself is desperately wicked. It's corrupt from top to bottom. There's not a just man upon the face of the earth. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. But if you turn to him as a filthy reprobate, he will wash your heart clean. And I look at myself 13 years on, there's things now that I'm doing and saying I would never have done before I was saved. I can remember cursing, gossiping, blaspheming before I was saved. I couldn't do it now. I couldn't blaspheme if you paid me to now. But every so often, I'll tell you something, every so often, if you push me hard enough, and I've had a few incidences where I've been pushed, those words come to my mind, those four letter words come to my mind, and I say, and I shut my mouth, my filthy mouth, I shut it. I don't let those filthy words come out of my mouth. And that's the battle of the two natures, the old nature and the new nature. And I'm not exempt from it. You know, Paul says that what I want to do, I don't do, and that what I don't want to do, I do. You know, Paul was an honest man, and I'm an honest man. I'll tell you the truth, it's hard dealing with the two natures of the believer. Uh, but where I've come from to where I am now, I've passed from death unto life. I've passed from judgment to being exonerated. I should have gone to hell many times before I was saved. But the Lord said, no, I'm going to save that guy. And he saved me. Why he bothered? I don't know. I'm not worth it. You're not worth it. But I'm glad he did. And I'll get saved again and again and again and again if I had to. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. So, there you are. And I keep saying, there you are, and I spend another 20 minutes uh, covering different subjects. I'm like Paul. Paul would say, you know, and finally, brethren, and finally, brethren, and finally, brethren. And he goes on for another three or four chapters. And finally, brethren, and he goes on for another five chapters. Uh, and that's fine. You know, as long as what you're hearing is honest, and it is, as long as what you're getting from this ministry is uh, heartfelt, and it is, that's fine. Uh, but above all, as long as it's Christ-centered, as long as it can be substantiated by the Word of God, that's what I'm interested in, really. I don't want to be one of those people that spends all their time talking about themselves, you know, me, 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 um, you know, or woe is me, or, you know, some of these disgruntled, bitter characters, and there are many of them on YouTube. I don't care for those people. You know, they've got too much time in their hands, and uh, they'll be the ones crying in heaven, I think. They'll arrive at the judgment seat of Christ, and they'll have no one to, no, there'll be nobody at the judgment seat waiting for them. They'll have no one to say, that man over there or that woman over there, witness to me, led me to you, Lord. They'll arrive at the judgment seat with no one to show for their life. No achievement, nothing whatsoever. And I'll say, hey, you know what? That man over there or that woman over there, same age as me, came from the same background as me. And, uh, you know, I could have done so much more. He did so much more, she did so much more. And they're going to be just shocked. They'll be absolutely devastated that they didn't do more with their lives. Don't let it happen to you, my friends. Please don't let it happen to you. If you can do something for the Lord, do it. And if you can't do it directly, do it indirectly. Pray for those that are doing frontline ministry work. Pray faithfully for those that are doing frontline ministry work. And if you can, stand with those that are doing frontline ministry work. But above all, do something. Please do something for the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord bless you all. And Maranatha.